Yeah, this is uh, Paper Boy. It's an excerpt from Paper Boy. Paper Boy trying to be a real boy. Uh, trying, not doing it. But, uh, triple Deuce wasn't crowded. Scattered sets of parents watching their children run around the playground. Their children sliding down the curved slide Eunice runs pissed down after midnight. Andy the goth taking a nap on the base of the flagpole spread like a lobster. Spike braceleted wrist over his eyes, his school bag presumably loaded with weed and Xanax serving as his pillow. And there was the ashy sweet fragrance of barbecued meat wafting from the backyards across the street. Lock down, lock down, Frankie called out while Chris entered the basketball court. Fuck you, Chris replied casually. Frankie's voice had come to shake him up. He had not been one of them, had not grown up in the neighborhood. Frankie was an interloper, Chris had realized, an interloper who seized power, just like Napoleon. Except mm -hmm. Frankie was 160 of muscle, had a tattoo of a snake with a stick of dynamite mm -hmm. between his teeth on his chest. He'd explained his cousin had gotten the same tat in prison and spiked his black hair high on his head so it looked like a crown. So maybe they weren't that similar. But who knows how Napoleon would have looked if he hung out at the park. Hippie Mrs. Kennedy said Frankie had a baritone voice. Mm -hmm. She said Frankie could be a great singer if he applied himself. That embarrassed him, being accused of having talent. He blew off the last few music classes of the semester and punched Bruce Miller in the face for calling him Sinatra. That punch got Frankie expelled one week before graduation and cost Holy Cross the city baseball championship. It even nearly started a beef between Frankie and Gould on the account of Gould being boys with Bruce, who was also the quarterback of the football team. Bruce had broken his right index finger while throwing one of the plastic cafeteria chairs. My finger got caught in the slit, he moaned repeatedly while writhing underneath the lunchroom table he usually presided over like an earl in his court. It all got settled the day before Chris's party when Frankie and Diego robbed the pharmacy where Aida worked while Chris distracted her. Frankie gave Bruce Miller 10 pillboxes of Vikes as an apology. Frankie's goodwill was actually an apology to Gould more than anything else. Even though Frankie was alpha status, nobody in New York City wanted it with Ghoul. Ghoul was heading to Notre Dame because he lifted other 200 pound bodies and tossed them down like mannequins. So there was peace. A war averted between the Holy Cross varsity letterman and the Triple Deuce crew, with star left tackle Duncan Ghoul Combs caught between loyalties. Dog, this is some West Side Story shit right here, yeah. Diego had commented at the height of the two week tensions. The irony was that Frankie <laughs> ultimately embraced the nickname. It had even become his aim address, Thug Sinatra, 6969. <laughs> Lock down, Frankie repeated. Whatever the fuck ever, Chris answered colder. Yo, Diego said and gave Chris a hug. Sweaty motherfucker, Chris said. Aye, aye, Diego said. What up, stranger, Adrian said. They exchanged a pound. Your chest hairs look up, dog, Chris said. That's what the ladies like, kid. The kid is back. Hey, hey, see money. Grace in the park with his presence. Last time you were here, I think there were icicles on the benches, B. Locked down, locked down. Did you ask her permission? Are you officially Saladino now? Hey, don't be talking to my future brother-in-law like this. Yo, you all chill, okay? All you chill the fuck out. He's my future brother-in-law coming through. We're happy to see C money, right? We always happy to see C money up in here, Diego announced. And then came one of those sudden silences. We've been seeing little Jay up in here more than you, Frankie said, like the levity was over. Guess I've been hitting the books, Chris said. Right, right, you're a college man. Where's Ghoul today, anyway? He's touring Notre Dame with his pops. So why don't you give him any shit? Because I trust him, Frankie said. Did I ask for your trust? Chris retorted, didn't you? No. Well, you think helping us with that thing the other day makes everything all good, like it's all good you've been dipping because you got a conversation with a girl in the aisle while we did the real shit? Mm -hmm. Yo, chill, Diego said, step between their two bodies. No one needs to chill, Chris said, staring straight into Frankie's eyes. We cool, Frankie said. All right, let's play some two on two, Adrian said enthusiastically. We know Chris our whole life, Diego reminded Frankie. Yeah, yeah, Frankie said. Yeah, yeah, what motherfucker, Chris said. And he pushed up against Diego. Diego was shorter than both of them, 5'8". There was a smacking sound as he laid his hand on Frankie's bare chest. I don't have no leash, it's handy. So both you pitch chill, he said, managing a thin smile. Sometimes he actually did sound like the oldest of them, which he was, older than Chris by a year. It always had been implicit, even if they didn't realize. Diego was the oldest of the older brothers. I didn't start nothing, Chris said. What did I start, Frankie said, hands raised with mock defensiveness. Locked down, locked down. Ah, uh, come on, B, have a sense of humor. You ain't never here no more. You're lucky I just got jokes. You actually don't got jokes. Whatever, yeah, yeah, Frankie repeated. Yeah, yeah, yesterday don't matter. That's what I was gonna say. Yesterday don't mean shit anymore. Chris reached into his pocket and pulled out a handball. He bounced it on the pavement a couple of times. 
One-on-one, -on -one, he said to Diego. Diego glanced at Adrian, and then he stared longer at Frankie. What, are we not invited, Frankie said. What's up, C-Money? Diego said to Chris softly. One-on-one, -on -one, Chris repeated, and bounced the ball harder on the pavement. Go ahead, go on your little date, Frankie said to Diego. I play handball, Adrian offered to Chris. Mm -hmm. Not now, Chris said. Fine, Diego said. For all times, Chris said to Diego. And he had not intended on saying such a sentimental thing, especially in front of Frankie. But after he said those words, it was like a ripple of understanding passed between him and Diego. Adrian, go wake up sleepy over there, Frankie said, gesturing toward Andy the goth. We'll smoke up down the block. You two have a romantic time. Chris wanted to fire the handball right in Frankie's face. He remembered two years ago feeling like Frankie was the coolest person he'd ever met. Frankie spoke with a different accent. Frankie knew about life in a different city. He seemed to notice all the same ridiculousness about Queens that Chris and Diego did. The way Queens was supposed to be about diversity, even though the white kids, Asian kids, and black kids sat at different tables in the lunchroom. The way Whitestone was supposed to be an upscale neighborhood, even though there were sneakers slung over the cable wires, just like they had been in Frankie's old neighborhood, Woodlawn. Frankie and Adrian walked over to Sleepy Andy. Frankie kicked Andy right in the knee and told him to get his ass up because they want to smoke. Adrian saluted the American flag above, then stood still as a soldier until Frankie popped him in the stomach while Sleepy Andy started to stir. Aye, right, let's play, Diego said, and scooped the bouncing handball while he headed toward the court. Chris followed. Diego bounced the ball between his open palm and the cement. So what's this about? Are we playing for some serious money or what? Old times, Chris said. Ah, right, Diego said. The handball court always felt unique to Chris compared to the rest of the park. It was the way the sun would get trapped and sealed against the sand-colored wall, the way the cement was submerged lower than the rest of the park, the way their silhouettes across these surfaces would look like giants, as if their shadows were real and their bodies the trick of light. The same scaly old man with his bush-thick chest hairs was sunning himself in the far corner of the court. There were white birds perched atop the wall. One bird was pecking on the other bird. On the opposite side of the wall, the cue played the Rolling Stones and the competitive players thumped through another heated game. Epitaphs flying and sneakers squeaking, the cry of war cackling from their boombox. The same scaly old man sunning himself was part of that handball league. When it was his turn to play, they called to him in Italian from behind the wall. He'd always rub his eyes, put down his magazine, and saunter to the other side. He sunned himself even when both sides of the wall were busy. It wasn't uncommon for some kid to go flying into him, chasing after his serve. Move, motherfucker, they'd say. He never would. That was his spot. Whitestone was a place where people just got used to things not changing. The younger men would simply play around the older men, sharing space. Diego smacked the ball toward the wall. It ricocheted back toward Chris with that satisfying rubbery clop made the sound of one of their giant shadow cells clicking his tongue, hop, hop. The ball banged from their palms and against the wall. It quickly became competitive out of a shared sense of muscle memory, passing the time when they were children, when time was weightless and before they knew their own malevolence. You got my sister home mad late last night, Diego said, while he ran from one side of the court to, the, to another. You my mother now or something, Chris shot back while he smacked the ball against the wall. He missed this feeling, the rubber collapsing against his palm, giving way, obeying his command. No, Diego said and laughed again. He missed the ball while laughing. Chris had the lead. It's just that my mom gets worried and complains to me about it. She still thinks we can be such good boys. Don't you know, C-Money? Hey, man, Chris said and hit the next serve against the wall. Diego coughed while returning the ball toward Chris. They both decelerated at the same time, unable to maintain that frantic pace, weightlifters with weak cardio games. I can do better with getting her home early. We just went cruising after the party. I'll, I'll keep it in mind, though, Chris offered. What a guy you are, Diego said, and swiped at the air while the ball ricocheted off a pole in the fence. Fuck, he shouted, his voice bouncing off the wall. The tanning man glanced up. Chris jogged over to retrieve the ball. He'd been hoping this would not feel so difficult. He'd been hoping by speaking with Diego instead of Frankie, it would go smooth as the court cement. He scooped the ball and jogged back toward Diego, flipping him the ball. Diego caught it, befuddled. You still playing, dog? I'm not dealing at school, Chris said. He had said it, what he needed to say, but not in his chest felt less like death. Dog, Diego said, and he bounced the ball softly. That's how it is, that's how it's gonna be. We had plans, we planned the shit out. I mean, we got you that scale and everything. I'm not dealing at school, I decided. I'm sorry I'm fresh up there. This was gonna be great money, Diego said, like Chris was on fire and turning down the hose. Do me a favor and tell Frankie. Why don't you tell him? You tell him, Chris said, hoping his expression was enough of an answer. What have you been talking about with my sister? It doesn't have to do with her. All of a sudden, you're part of a partnership for the drug-free America, Diego said. He whirled and threw the handball hard against the wall. It rolled away from them, underneath the patio chair of the tanning man. Just come to the links tomorrow night, he added, with his back still turned to Chris. He was looking toward the playground. 
A couple of children were running around with sparklers. They were so happy. Have a few drinks from the kegs, then we'll talk about this again. I'm not doing the links, Chris said. This has struck him as a lesser point, but it made Diego spin on his heels and charge. Fucking serious? Dog, it's the lamest shit ever. We're grown now, okay? We know what happens every year. It gets raided. So what? It's a fucking tradition. What are you, the keeper of the flame or some shit? It's a whack party and I'm done with it. I almost got bagged last year with an ounce on me, so come clean. I'm not coming, Chris said. And his next words came automatically, unplanned. I'm done. Wow, Diego said. He put his hands on his narrow hips. Shook his head. It went fine the other day, copping those pills that ate his job. You ain't worried. Nah, Chris said. And that was the honest truth. He hadn't even thought about getting caught for helping them. It suddenly occurred to him that he had used Aida for the first time since it happened. He thought it might have been a mistake, even though she didn't know and would not know. Then what are you worried about, Diego demanded. I, Chris started. He shook his head. These were the only words coming to him, so he said them. I'm tired of hurting people, man. Diego put his fingers over his chin. He had a look of contemplation similar to his sister's, though they thought nothing of the same things. They ain't tired of hurting you. 